All right. Well, welcome, everybody. And uh, I'm in Kalamazoo, Michigan. There really is such a place. And here it's a few minutes after 8 o'clock in the evening. So um, let me tell you, I, I understand that most of you have been reading the book, or at least you were assigned to read the book. I know sometimes how that goes, having been a grad student myself. But I will be um, touching on a lot of the stuff that is in the book, the material in the book. So if you haven't read it, this will be a good Cliff Notes session for you. Um, just by way of, of background, I've, I've been in training and development a long time. I started as a training officer in the United States Navy um, in 1965. So been in training a long time, did a doctorate in program evaluation, and was involved for about 15 years or so principally as an evaluator. But then um, about 15 years ago, in working, doing some evaluation studies with the World Bank, basically um, told me, they said, Brinkeroff, we're sick of giving you money to evaluate our programs and have you tell us that they're not working. So what they did was they gave us a grant for three years to take everything that we'd learned um, in evaluation about why training was not working, not working well, and create a model for training that would work. They said, well, imagine that we were betting uh, the future of a country on training working or betting the business on training working, how would we do it? And that was the birth of something called high impact learning that I'd written a few books about. And then about six years ago, I partnered with um, Advantage Performance Group, which is a training company, um, which has since been bought by BTS, Business Training Simulations, a global company headquartered in Sweden. And they wanted to adopt the methodology so um, we, we took the high impact learning, which was the process for making sure that training would work, and we began to develop that so companies could use that methodology. And that has been branded as something called the Advantage Way. So you'll see sometimes Advantage or Advantage Way on some of these slides. Uh, that's synonymous with high impact learning. But since we have started collaborating together, we, we took the the methodology out to a number of about 50 companies globally that we have certified and they've formed a user group. And what we realized was they really also needed to have a measurement methodology, a way of being able to tell whether the training was making a difference. And so we continued work with the success case method, something that I'd created about 15 years ago as well, and built that into it. So there's sort of an agenda implied in the success case method and we'll get to that, sort of what that agenda is as we go forward. So with that, I think we'll get, um, we'll get started. Um, the criteria that when I created Success Pace Method, there were four criteria in mind. First off, that evaluation had to be credible, that if senior leaders didn't believe the data, then we were not going to get off the base. It had to be valid. It had to look at the true value and impact of training. It had to be simple. That, that is both simple to do and simple to understand. And above all, it had to be actionable. It had to be able to do something worthwhile with the evaluation data. I mean, I firmly believe that if, a, if an organization was going to take a dollar of their training resources that were intended to benefit their clients and divert that dollar into evaluation and measurement, then their clients had to end up getting more than a dollar's worth of value for that. Otherwise, it was not legitimate to, to do the measurement. So those were the four criteria. And I'll stop there and just ask if there are any questions on those. That making sense to people? Yes. Yeah. OK. Well, well, let's dig into the success case method. And I'm going to start by going over two realities of training. I think there are. There are two realities of corporate or organizational or workplace learning and training that if you're going to think about evaluation, you've got to really be clear on what these realities are. So to get to the first reality, I want to do a brief exercise with you. I want you to imagine that, we put, that, that you've followed up several thousand people who've been through the typical corporate training program, the typical corporate soft skills training program, like Management 101, or Introduction to Supervision. And you follow them up to find out what they're actually doing with their training and what impact it's had. And so of these thousands of people you followed up, now the 
that they're back at work, you found out that, that your findings fell into three categories. Over on the far right side, you found some percentage of people who took their training, used it in their work, and, and produced a concrete and valuable result for their organization using their training. Over on the far left side, you found some percentage of people who didn't use their training at all. In fact, you couldn't find any evidence in their work that they had been through the training, but you know they had been because your data told you they had been. And then in the middle, you found some percentage of people who tried a little bit of this, tried a little bit of that from the training, couldn't really make it work, and eventually went back to doing things the way they used to do them. So I'm going to ask you to just take a moment. If you're in the classroom, you all talk to each other. I'm going to give you about one minute to uh, jot down your findings. You've already done the research. So jot down what, what percent did you find in each of the three categories. So I'll just give you a minute to do that, and then I'll come back on. And you can certainly talk to each other while you're doing that. Okay, does everybody have something jotted down for that right-hand category and that left-hand category in the middle? Yep. Okay, somebody want to volunteer. What, what's a number, what's a percent that you've got in the right-hand column? Yeah. I didn't hear that. What did you have? Ten percent. Ten percent, okay. Anybody have more than ten? All of you have 10 percent? You have less than 10? percent. I, I missed that. 5 percent. 5 percent. I Anybody? have 5 as well. Okay, 5. Let's jump over to the left. What did you have on the far left? 5. 5. Anybody different? 5. 5. That's not different from five. Anybody got a different? <laughs> I said I said at least twenty percent. Twenty percent, okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody more pessimistic than that? <laughs> so um, you've either done the research or you've read the book. So let's take a look at what if you'd really done the research, what would you find? And this is this is a pretty predictable result from if you evaluated training that you would find that, in fact, typically a small percentage of people use the training and the bulk of them either don't use it or don't use it well and gravitate back to what they were doing. So this is, this is highly predictable. I've done hundreds of evaluations of training and we found this over and over and over again. In fact, it got to the point where we felt like um, we could tell clients who wanted us to do an evaluation, we say, look, we'll save you money. We don't need to collect any data. We'll just tell you what you got. If we put 100 people through training, I'll tell you what you got. Some of them used it, some of them didn't, and everybody else was in the middle. So that's, that is the reality. So we can sort of say, well, so this is reality number one. Training gets predictable results. So if you think about the implications of that, if your organization pays for the entire, whoever your client is, they pay for the whole distribution, but they only get a return for the percent of people who are using it. So return on investment in training is entirely driven by how large is that percent in the right-hand column. Um, and so one of the implications of this reality is that one of the purposes for evaluation, then, is to try to grow that right-hand part of the distribution. And there's a second implication, and that is that if the people who use the training and get results, they represent the realized value from the training investment. The people who didn't use it represent the unrealized value. So let me just give you a quick little example. Imagine we put 
uh, 100 people through training and you have 10 people over on the right side who use their training and the value of their using it was um, $50,000 per participant, well then this training returned a total of $500,000 um, in value. But think about the people who didn't use it, the 90 of 100 who didn't use it, if they had used it as well as the 10, then this training could have produced another four and a half million dollars in value. Now that's if everybody used it as well as those 10 percent had and some people might say well that's really not very likely but if you think about it if you've got a distribution where you have 10 people in the right and the other 90 either in the middle or on the left there's, there's only two possible explanations for that distribution. One is that the training is a hundred percent effective and it could only have worked with those 10 people, and the other 90 are too ignorant um, or incompetent to have made use of the training. The second possible explanation for the distribution is that more people could have been on the right, but something got in their way. Let me show you an example of unrealized value from out of the user group, because I want to give you a notion of how this first reality of predictable results sort of translates into um, practice. That here, this was a company out of the user group that did an evaluation not too long ago, and this happened to be marketing training for senior directors in the organization. This is a huge engineering company, global, and they're trying to get their, their um, director level people and above to think more like marketing people and less like tech. So they put people through this um, week-long training in um, how to think more like and lead more from a marketing perspective. Good news was the people absolutely loved the training. It was rated a 4.8 on a five-point scale. It was the best training they felt they'd ever had in the company. And when we measured the return on investment or the impact of the training, the training cost for 300 people to go through at about $900,000. But these folks using the success case method were able to document $1.8 million in new operating income that came from this training, So, in other, from usage, usage of the training. So in other words, the training was a pretty good a winner. People loved it, and the company doubled their money on it. So you might say, well, what's the problem then? But as they dug deeper, it was only 60 of these 300 people who used the training and got the value. So you had 240 people who didn't use it. Hmm. Now what we said was, because they're going to eventually roll this training out to about 1,800 such people, we said, look, if you keep going at this 20% impact rate, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. So we asked, well, what if just 60 more people had used this training and they'd only used it half as well as the 60 who used it? that would have returned another $900,000 more in value. In other words, they would have gotten their money back yet over again. So that's, that's one of the implications of this application. Now, I want to go back for just a moment to this distribution that a, another implication of this predictable results thing is that most evaluation methods we realized as we were using them, and I was classically trained in research methods, but most evaluation methods are based on um, typical and traditional research methodology where you measure everybody and then you calculate a mean or an average. And what, what we realized was that all training was coming out to be very mediocre. Even if the people who used the training got great results, and if you looked at that, that unrealized example again, you'd see that um, 20 people used the training and got great value, but on average, if you start adding in the other 240 people who didn't use it, then on average, this training looks to have very pallid results. So what we realized was that the wrong question is to ask, in general, how is the training working, or on average, how is the training working, because on average, all training is not working very well. But the, the better question to ask is, when the training works, what good does it do? Hmm. So that led us to say, we shouldn't be looking for the typical result. We should be looking for the best result, the 
exemplary result, and then trying to find out how you duplicate that uh, exemplary result. So let me go up to some of the implications of this first reality number one. The first reality is avoid the tyranny, what I'd call the tyranny of the mean. Don't use typical let's calculate a mean procedures because those will always mask the, the true value that the training could be producing. Calculate the unrealized value and aim to grow impact. So in the, in the high impact learning model, this is the goal. And this is um, of a, 50 companies in the user group um, that are using the high impact learning methodologies. Their goal is that when they took, put people through training, they will see not 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 percent, but they'll see 85 percent or more that use the training and get value from it. So if that's the goal, then the good question is, why aren't companies there now? Why did all of you estimate, well, 5 or 10 percent? Why is it that training isn't? And that's what the research shows, and it's been showing that for the last 30 or 40 years. Why isn't training doing better than that? And that takes us to the second reality. So I want to do another brief little exercise with you here. Um, I want you to imagine that you have done the definitive research on training failure, why training fails. And so you studied hundreds of failed training programs to get at the root cause analysis of why they failed. And what I mean by failed is these are programs that failed to return value to their organization. So when you did this root cause analysis, you found that there were three principal causes for failure of training. The first cause would be considered what we call failures of preparation and readiness, where the people who participated in the training, wrong ones, or they weren't prepared to participate, or there wasn't alignment with senior management as to why the training was important, managers didn't support it, etc. The second principal cause of failure you found in your research was that some of these programs failed just because the training itself is no good. People wanted to learn it, but they couldn't because the training design was bad, the materials were bad. Uh, the facilitator did a bad job, et cetera. And the third reason for failure you found was what you'd call failures of the application environment, that people learned it, but when they got back to work, something kept them from being able to use it. They didn't have time to do it. They didn't have support in doing it. There was uh, lack of incentives, et cetera. So those are what your research found is that um, your, your failure causes fell into three pretty common categories. So what I'd like you to do now is just jot down your estimates of what percent of all the failures were caused by each of the three categories. Just jot those, jot those percentages. And you folks who are in the classroom, you can talk to each other. I don't hear you talking, are you? <laughs> yeah, we're talking, but in the All right. my head is muted. And now that the mic's up, it be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that figures. So everybody got something written down? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Let me, um, let me get some people from the class to respond to this. I'd like you to just tell me what percent you have in that Somebody tell me, what percent do you have in that middle category here? Say it nice and loud. Ten. 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 <laughs> Anybody with different numbers? Fifteen. Fifteen. Thirty. Thirty. Anybody? Do we have Twenty. A, Twenty. Okay. Let's jump over to the right-hand column. Percent there. Speak up. Speak up. Seventy. 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 
We had one for 80. We got one for 80. Okay. 60. Okay. So it's obvious we've got a lot of training practitioners in this group. <laughs> so let's take a look at what, if you'd really done the research, what you'd come up with. And Ow. what you see is that less than 20% of the failures can be traced back to the problem with the training intervention itself. That the principal causes of failure are either in that first or the third category. Hmm. Now, one of the things we discovered from doing a lot of this research is that just like you estimated, 70, 80, even 90 percent would be in that right-hand column, that's where we found many of the failures of being manifested. So you'd find people not using it, and they were not using it because maybe their manager didn't support it or they didn't have time. But when we looked at the root causes of those failures, they took us back over to this first category of preparation and readiness, that a lot of the reasons why people weren't applying the training and weren't um, supporting it were because they never believed in it in the first place. So. To give you sort of a, a crass example, if, if I'm your boss and there's some training coming up and I'm going to let you participate in it, even though I think the training is a no good waste of time, I'm going to let you participate anyway because it's already in the budget and I know HR would get on my case if I didn't let you participate. So I let you participate. Now, that's clearly a failure of preparation and readiness. I don't believe in the training. I think it's a stupid, no good waste of time. But how will that become manifest? It'll become manifest not supporting using it. As soon as you show up back at work from this training, say, good, I'm glad the training's done. Let's get back to something important now. So in other words, we'll have a failure in that right-hand column. So reality number two that when training fails, it's least often failure of the training event itself, and the principal causes of failure are in those other two categories. So if we're to look at that sort of from a model, it says that that the, the learning to performance process is more than just delivering training, that if you're serious about results from training, there's three things you've got to do well. You have to quality learning intervention, for sure. They can't be no good. They've got to be, um, from an adult learning instructional design perspective, they've got to be high quality. You have to <coughs> create focus and build intentionality. You have to make sure that there's alignment, focus, and intentionality, that the training is clearly linked to business goals that people care about, see what the link is, and that they, are, that they believe that the link is worthwhile. And then the third thing you have to do is you have to support and nurture improvement because train, learning is fragile when it's new. All of those things have to be done and done well if you're going to get results from training. So, and it's clear, too, that the greatest opportunities for improving results from training are not by improving the learning intervention, but by making changes in the first and the third parts of the process. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's, that's reality. And what we realized is that almost all evaluation was focused on the training itself. And so if you're serious about trying to find out what to do to get the training to work better, then you've got to evaluate the entire process, find out what's working and what isn't, and then particularly make changes in the parts of the process that need to be improved in order to uh, get better results. So some implications of that are that we don't try to single out the sole effects of training. The sole effects of training are always zero. Training always interacts with the performance environment, and value doesn't come from people participating in training. It comes from them using their training. So we want to then pinpoint the key performance system factors, manager behaviors that are making a difference. So some implications are stop evaluating training and instead evaluate how well your organization is using training to get results.
So the focus that look, you getting results from training is a whole organization accountability. It can't be delegated to a training department. And so you have to evaluate how well the whole organization is using training to get results. And that's where you start getting some real payoff from evaluation. You can't delegate responsibility for results to a training department. It's a whole organization responsibility. So let me, let me just stop there and see if folks have any questions before we take a look at the success case method and how it works. Uh, I have a question for you, Dr. Minneapolis, Tony. Sure. Um, you said to, to stop evaluating training. You saying stop evaluating training alone or stop evaluating uh, training altogether? Well, I, I want to change the focus. So, yeah, I'd say you, you don't evaluate the training. What you do is you evaluate how well the organization is using training to get results. Okay, so even though you said that there's a 20 percent uh, contribution for the, the training not being either delivered well or produced well, or, yep. uh, you're still going to ignore that and focus on the, the transfer of that training to the job. If, if, if I'm after the impact of the training, absolutely. Now, um, of course, if you're, if you're using good quality management approaches, you would assess the quality of the training before you ever delivered it. So, um, you know, you, you absolutely should assess the rigor and quality of training designs and whether they're any good or not, but you don't have to, you don't have to implement the training to find out whether it's any good or not. And if you, okay, so absolutely you still do that, but um, it's obvious that if you're if you really want to find out where the gold is buried, as far as what do you need to look at to get results, you have a much, you have like an 80 percent probability of getting at the real levers to improve things if you look at the whole process. Okay. We have one more question here. Sure. Dr. Breger, line with you. So you were saying that it's more important to increase that managerial support before you look at redeploying the training program. Yeah, I didn't catch all of that question just because our sound transmission isn't good. Um, I think you were saying we look also at managerial behaviors, but then I lost the rest of it. Uh, yeah, speak up. Okay, well, uh, yeah, I was saying so it's more important to increase managerial support or organizational uh, support before you look at retooling the training program. Um, well, assuming that the training itself is any good, yes. Let me, let me give you an idea of, of how we sort of discovered this lesson. We had contracts, um, some colleagues and I, we had contracts to evaluate training from some of the biggest vendors. So we were working with like Blanchard, DDI, um, Achieve Global, et cetera. And what we, what we did is we, we could go into one company, like Company A, and we'd find out they were using like situational leadership and getting great business impact from it. And we go into another company that was using exactly the same training, delivered by exactly the same facilitators to exactly the same kinds of people, and that company's not getting any results. And even within the same company, we find that one unit, one business unit is using situational leadership and shooting the lights out as far as getting business value. And another unit isn't getting getting the same training but isn't getting any value. And even within the same classroom, <coughs> you'd find people, they were all sitting there, they all went through exactly the same program, yet some of them went back and used it and got great results and others didn't. So when, you, when you're getting this huge variation in results but you're holding the treatment constant, then you know something else is going on. Now, we already knew because if the training is working for some of the people, chances are the training is fine. But if it isn't working for everybody, what's going on? Either the training doesn't fit them right, and they never should have been in it in the first place, or something's getting in their way. But 
the, also, when we first started creating the success case method, and this was very instructive, we, we first started out by defining successes um, as people who aced the test at the end of the training and really thought the training was great. So we only followed up people who did a really well on an end of, end of training performance test and who really liked the training. And what we figure in, gee, if anybody's using it, it'd be these people. But what we found was that even most of those people weren't using it. So um, it's just that if, if you know that the training itself is reasonably good, but it isn't getting used, chances are it's not getting used not because it wasn't good enough, but because there wasn't belief in alignment and managerial support for it. Make sense? Yes. Thank you. Let's go on and take a quick look at the, the method, and then we'll come back to some questions. This graphic is trying to represent what I call the anatomy of impact. It's when training works, what happens? So let me explain some parts of this picture here. <laughs> this, this box over on the left represents the learning intervention. So this could be a workshop, a seminar, an online training module, a job rotation. It's some learning intervention. And coming out of a learning intervention, assuming it had some efficacy, people learn some things, some skills. And that's what these little circles represent, skill or knowledge. These are the things that people learned in the training. Then this large box here represents the workplace, either their individual or their team's job. And these little boxes inside it represent parts of the job. So these are different parts of the job. Now, what, when training works, what happens is somebody takes a skill they learned and they use it in a part of their job, not just any old part of their job, but a part of their job that if they did that part better, it would produce a result that would contribute to a valuable goal of the organization. So in other words, depending on what the business goal is, some parts of the job are higher leverage than other parts of the job. So the greatest success from training comes not from the person who learned the most. It isn't about who got the most, who had the most S's. So it isn't the people who learned the most. <laughs> and it's not necessarily the people who use it the most because they could use it all over the place but never use it in the part of their job that they needed to do better in order to produce a result that would lend value to the business. So the, the training impact race is one not by who learns the most, not by who uses the most, but who uses something the best. And so this, what we call these, this thread of impact where someone took a skill, used it, produced a result to achieve a goal, that's what we're looking for when we do a six-case study. Because when training works, that's what's happening. So we'll take a look quick at the six-case process and then uh, open it up for questions. So success case method is, in essence, a two-step process. The first is identify who are probably the most and the least successful trainees. That is, who's using it and who, and who isn't. And we typically do that survey. And it's typically, uh, it's a very brief survey that is essentially one item. And that item would ask, so if you all had been through some training and I'm sending you the survey, it's now going to say, I'm just going to send you a one-question survey, and it'll say, to what extent have you used something you learned in this training in a way that you know is making a valuable difference? Now, I might ask that question three or four or five different ways, but in essence, it's a one-item survey. Go to webinar, web events made easy. Look at this distribution. Who's most likely out of this distribution to be using the training? Probably not the people on the left, not the people in the middle. It's probably the people here. So that's where I'm going to go digging for my success. Now, will there be some false positives in there? Of course there will be. 
but the, the chances of false positives there are much less than they are somewhere else in the institution. So the second step, I'm simply going to dig into parts of this distribution and pull random samples out and do some interviews. So the second step of a success case study is to do some interviews with carefully selected people from out of the parts of the distribution. <laughs> and what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask them, now if you're on the phone, I've got you interviewing, you'll say, so exactly what did you use? And exactly what results are you getting? And how did you use it? And when did you use it? And where did you use it? And how do you know those results have value? And my criterion for the quality of the evidence is, comes from judicial model. I'm looking for evidence that would stand up in court that you have you learned something in the training, you used it, and it's making a difference, and I can prove it. And now from the, the far left part of the distribution, <coughs> I'm not asking them how they used their training because they already told me they didn't. So what I'm going to find out from them is, what, what got in your way? How come you didn't use this training? What happened? And with the people from the right, too, the people did use it, I'm also going to be asking them, and what I'd do if I had you on the phone, I'd say, well, look, have you ever been to training before that even though it was great and you learned something, you ended up not using it? And what would you guess people would answer to that question? Have you ever been to training before that you liked it and worked, and it, but you didn't end up using it? Does that ever yes. happen? Sure. Yes. Everybody say yes. Say, okay, what was different this time? How come you did the training before and it, you never used it? How come you used this? And following that line of questioning, I'll begin to get at what are the factors that help them use this training. So coming out of the um, second step, <laughs> I'll find out when it worked. From these people, I'm going to find out what results did they get, what was the value of those results. And now I can actually... If I need to calculate some kind of return, I can figure out well, when the training works and produces value, how much value? What good does it do? And I can then, from that, I can figure out from all the people who didn't use it what was the unrealized value. And so we can do some stuff about figuring out when the training's working, what, what good is it doing. <laughs> and by the way, since we're always looking for the best the training is doing, people always say, well, this is a biased, this is a biased approach. And I'll say, good, you're beginning to catch on. It is indeed biased. I'm looking for the best training is doing, because if the best it's doing is not worth anything, then we're done. So um, i get my pointer back here so I can move this slide. <laughs> so coming out of the success case study, I've got two principal buckets of information. I've got, assuming that I found some, I've got credible, documented, stand up in court instances of the training working and making a difference. And I now have my finger on what are the factors that seem to be getting in the way or helping get impact. And now by reporting those factors back to the people who can do something about them, we can really begin to get some traction for improving the training. So for example, if I found out that district managers are not supporting their sales reps who've been through the training and helping them use it, but I know that when the training does get used, it, it increases sales. If I report that information to the vice president of sales and say, look, <laughs> I've got some good news for you. When the training works, it's increasing your sales 15%. The bad news is that only 10% of your sales force is using the training. And when senior leaders get hold of information like that, they'll say, wait a minute. I hear you right. You're saying that, that this training we spent all this money on is really getting great results, but only 10% of the people are using it. And they'll say, that's exactly right. And they'll say, do you know what would happen if you got 10% more using it, half as well, how much that would be worth? <clears throat> and they'll, once they hear what that number is, they'll say, okay, why aren't they using it? And then I've got them. Because now we can say, well, here's some reasons why they're not using it. These, this many districts managers are not supporting it. 
whatever those things are. And that's how you begin to get, when you start reporting the true impact of training, that's when you start to get senior manager attention. So some good things come out of this. Um, you've got evidence that the training works. You, you have wonderful data to market the training to downstream audiences. So like the company that was going to train 1,500 more managers, we can say, look, at this training will, will really work and make a difference to your bottom line. But it isn't a silver bullet. It isn't a magic pill. There's some things you have to do to make it. Uh, we can make a business case for improving the performance system. We can educate managers about their role and impact. Um, and all of that is really sort of the, 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 the long-range strategy of doing success case evaluation is to build an organization's capability to get continuously improved ROI, training investments, that most organizations have a severe learning disability. They don't get anywhere near the value from training that they could get. So what success based method is really management development in disguise. What we're trying to do is teach the organization how to get more value from learning investment. And we teach them by doing evaluation studies. So that um, that's the success case method, and and um, I'll be happy to respond to questions or comments or any reactions you might have. Dr. Bringer, this is Tony again. Yeah. Um, to what extent do you find that the success case method is used to formatively to change an ongoing program, an ongoing training program, and to what extent is it used sort of summatively to say, all right, this is what we did, but for our other other training programs, perhaps unrelated, these are the kinds of things we might look at to make them more effective. Yeah. Um, pretty much everybody that we use it with and everybody out of this user group of companies um, are using it in both ways. And um, But we, we really encourage them and on almost all of them do, to use it for, for programs. Um, there, there's some instances where we think there's big payoff. And one is um, if a company is going to roll out mandatory training to a whole lot of employees, by doing a success case study early in the rollout process, <laughs> you learn not only how to improve the training, but how to improve the traction of the training to get it to get more results. So that's a, a big way that it gets used. <coughs> or with um, mandatory management development courses that, um, you know, where all managers, when they hit a certain level, they'll go through advanced management 202 or whatever it is. What we find is that very often, because these courses are, are just sort of part of the management progression and succession process, is that they come to be viewed principally as like a staff benefit. Um, it's like, well, you know, I know when I get to this level, I'll go through these three courses. And that's good. It builds my resume, et cetera. So they're using success case method to try to um, tell people, look, you're not just accountable for going through these courses. You're actually accountable for using them. And they, they try to create that sense of accountability by getting evidence that the training is working. So some of, the, some of the people we work with use, use the success case method just in, a, as I'd say, a summative evaluation to sort of justify the budget or to provide proof, you know, if people are breathing down their neck and saying, is this training any good or not? You can, you can get evidence that it's making a difference. But those are, frankly, very non-strategic uses of it. And the much more strategic uses are to increase, accelerate adoption of a change that's coming in the organization. So, you know, imagine two companies, um, because this happened in the pharmaceutical industry or any sort of industry, that are both launching a new product at about the same time into the same market. And they're, both those companies are training their sales and service staffs to be able to sell that product and service 
the company that gets 80% of its sales force using that training right away is going to beat the daylights out of the company that, that is only getting 10 or 15% traction from the training. So the, the, that's a very strategic use of success case method is to accelerate the rate at which people pick up the training and use it. So we, most companies are using the success case method it's really mission critical training, training that they can't afford to not get more people using it fast. So thank, thank you, you for that. Good question. Dr. Brinkerhoff? Yes. It's Craig in Boise. Um, as you're evaluating these companies and you approach them with this uh, success case method, uh -huh. What are some of the roadblocks that you're presented with to get them to buy into this this way of thinking? Um, yeah, that's a good. That's a really good question. I think one of the biggest roadblocks is simply getting their attention. Um, to be honest, I think most senior leaders don't really expect training to do much for the business. They view it principally as an overhead and a cost, um, and they don't really expect it to pay off. So I think one of the biggest barriers we face is just simply getting them to care enough to um, even consume the results of the evaluation. And that's one of the biggest barriers. Um, I, I think helping them see that that they really should expect more from training. And often, the way you get them to expect more is to um, don't wait until they ask for an evaluation, but but do it proactively. Say, hey, you might be curious to know. You know, we spent ten million dollars on this training so far. You might be curious to know what good it's doing. Let me t let me have a minute and explain that to you. So we have to get quite proactive. I think that's one of the big barriers um, is just getting attention and time to do it. Most companies um, don't care enough about it to want to invest in doing the evaluation um, at all. So Craig, any, what other barriers would occur to you? Um, I think that was the initial one, and also, to me, a main one I see in businesses as I look at training is the trainers themselves buying into the idea that it needs to change. Yeah. I think you deal with the, the same percentages as you're approaching trainers as you, as you would the trainees. Yeah, I'm afraid you're right. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of fear and anxiety around. Um, measurement and evaluation, and I think discomfort and let's not, you know, let's not upset the apple cart here. Things aren't aren't that bad. And it's also, you know, it requires to do it requires you to get out of the training arena and do some pretty intense digging, and that's another barrier. I mean. A lot of people want automated evaluation, um, and a lot of companies are shifting over to these processes in the marketplace, like Matter, et cetera, that are, are plenty good products, but they're simply automating surveys and sending them out, and this is a more labor-intensive process. But I, I just firmly believe that if you're going to uh, just finding out what percent of people are using or not using their doesn't do you much good because you already know what those are likely to be. And the much bigger questions are only those you dig deeper where you where you get good answers to. Dr. Brinkerhoff, do you also think that defining the, the company defining what success is or having that ill defined is a, a, a barrier in, in some of these cases? Sure. Sure it is because you know, when we when we say, well, what do you expect this management development to be doing for you? Um, people mostly talk in terms of competencies. They say, well, our, our managers will be better at this, they'll be better at that, better at this. And 
so it's very sometimes difficult to get them. We'll say, well, let's say they were better at that. What difference would it make? And many of them haven't thought that far, sort of into the impact model. So I think you're right. Uh, that's also a barrier is that just getting the expectations out. And I think that's also intimidating to, to training departments because as long as the expectations are just that the training will be pleasant and enjoyable and that people will believe they learn from it, that's good enough. But it really isn't good, of course. Uh, we are open to one more question. Dr. Brigham, this is Mike from Voice Ad Hub. Yeah, Mike. A lot of companies like uh, American Express, World Bank, Dell, Compact. It's a lot of computer-based programming. Uh, I wonder if you've used any social media networks, such as LinkedIn, Facebook, Wikis, and connect your trainings. And if so, what challenges did you face? And also, is there any maybe threats to this CSM to this new tech training technology? Yeah, I think, Mike, I think that's a great a great question and a good insightful one. And I have never made um, really any use of the social networking technologies. They just haven't been around that long. They've been around a lot. I've been around a lot longer than they have. <laughs> I haven't really made that much use of them, but I'm convinced that there could be very good use made of them. So um, I, I really think they they could be leveraged quite well. But I. I, I done. So I, I think that's a great notion you've got, and I would encourage you to look at how you might do that. Can I ask one last question, Dr. Brickhoff? Sure. Are there any common errors that people who are new to the method uh, tend to make? That you've yeah. Seen? Yeah, I think there are. I think um, it, it's, it, it's elusively simple looking, and it's very simple in concept. But I think the, where m many people have gotten in trouble with it is that they, the interview part of it has to be really done well and extremely rigorously. And so when we've, um, we have a cadre of people that we have trained to do success case studies, um, and we also have been training people in companies to do it. And, Unless they really, um, when, when we train the people, we really emphasize over and over again the, the need to drill down in the interviews and to do them very rigorously. It's a, it's a, behavior, a rigorous behavioral interview. And what I think people often do, as soon as they get someone on the phone and you know, the, the person on the phone says, well, uh, the training was really great and I really used it. In fact, I used it in three different ways. And, I've used it with my direct reports in my one-on-ones, and I've used it um, in reporting to my boss, and I've also used it in um, networking with peers. And people say, okay, great, and they don't dig into that. And what you, what you have to do is you really have to dig. You say, so you said you used it um, in your one-on-ones. Give me an example of what you use and how you use that. And uh, what we often find is that when you start digging you, you, um, very hard, you turn up that what would look like a positive, really a false positive. So I think that that's the biggest mistake is not being rigorous enough in the interview process and just settling for testimonial data rather than truly behavioral, evidence-based um, sort of data that would stand up in court that, yes, the training was used and made a difference. Um, another, another mistake is not thinking through carefully enough at the front end what, uh, what the impact should be and why it would have value to the organization, but not taking enough time at the beginning to really think that through and to conceptualize the study sufficiently to make sure it's worth doing. <laughs> but great question. Yes. Um, and I've just put a slide up, uh, Viani. This is a crass commercial announcement, but a new um, a, a new book that we just published this year that has um, that talks about success case method in the context of our user group of these 45 companies. Or so and 
So this new book <coughs> is a study of the user groups who are using the success case mes method and high impact learning. And there's four um, good case studies in that book of um, companies that have been using it. So I'll just make people aware of that. All right. I would just like to, on, on behalf of myself and the students here in Boise, to uh, thank you again for your time. This was really terrific. Uh, do you have anything, uh, Dr. Bergerhoff, that you'd like to, to leave us with as far as parting words? Uh, no, I'll just say, um, you know, you, um, you're welcome. And uh, it was, I enjoyed the chance to do it. And the, the movie that my wife and I were watching was pretty boring anyway, so not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All well, right. thank you again, Dr. Brinkerhoff and everyone in the audience. And so this concludes the webinar with Dr. Brinkerhoff today. And now the webinar screen will be closed shortly. Okay. Bye -bye. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night.